Well, we covered this story Friday and it's a good yarn. We spoke to Julian Batchelor. He has started a group, a group called Stop Co-Governance, which, uh, as you can do in a functioning democ democracy, is really interested in um, stopping co-governance, which uh, even the government seems quite keen on slowing down a little bit and having a chat about right now since the change of Prime Minister. Well, he went and he's having 30 public meetings, he says, around the country for his group. And one of them was going to be in uh, Northland, in Whangarei, I think it is. And he went and approached, well, the only place with any decent venue by the sounds sort of, of it up there, Sport Northland, which is a publicly funded by four councils organisation that has all sorts of conference uh, facilities and sporting facilities. And they hire them out. They're on the net saying you can come and hire our stuff for meetings and get-togethers and things. So Julian Batchelor went to hire the venue. They asked what he was going to talk about. He told them he was going to talk about co-governance and his group's opposition to it. And they came back and said, no, nah, we're not going to let you hire out our venue to do that. And then we had a look at their Te Tiriti O Waitangi uh, and how they're a partnership and they're co-governed themselves. And it became pretty obvious why Sport Northland might decide that Mr Jepson, though being a member of the public and part of a group that isn't breaking any laws, wasn't allowed to use a public venue. Well, it has shades of similar attempts at cancellation by the woke left. We look at uh, Lauren Southern... Uh, Lauren Molyneux? Gosh, I have always get their names. <laughs> Southern and Molyneux. We look at Don Brash being kicked off Massey. We look at uh, st uh, Speak Up for Women uh, having to fight in court to get, uh, well, got kicked out of a Massey University venue, uh, then had to go to court to have meetings in other public or council venues. So am I being overly sensitive here? Or, and I may not agree with the views of this co-governance group and Julian Batchelor, but surely he's got the right as a member of the public to hire a public venue. We are joined now to discuss this, what might be the first shot in the cancel culture wars of 2023, by our friend Jonathan Ayling from the Free Speech Union. Jonathan, uh, welcome back to the platform. Good morning, Sean. Is this a storm in a teacup or a live issue? No, this is another indication of the real fight that is having to happen for free speech in our country. And uh, I, I, I think every uh, democracy-loving Kiwi uh, should be very concerned, m not just that uh, that there are attempts to change democracy, that's legitimate, democracy does evolve, and, and we need to have that conversation. The problem is we're not allowed to have the conversation, and that's what's really betraying the uh, authoritarian mindset that a lot of people are operating with uh, today. So once we became aware of this, uh, the Free Speech Union has become quite involved in this case, uh, supporting not what uh, this organisation stands for, but their right to contribute to a live debate. And so we're preparing legal action uh, against Sport Northland. We have reached out to them and uh, in no uncertain terms made uh, our absolute uh, refusal to accept what they've done known. Uh, we have a number of court cases under our belt now uh, that, that show that the court systems will not stand for this sort of picking and choosing who gets to have a say. So I, I think we're going to see them back down before too long, if I'm not surprised. OK, so Jonathan, you are taking, the Free Speech Union is taking Sport Northland to court or threatening to? Well, we, we, we certainly will if it comes to that. Um, we're hoping that uh, they'll do the right thing and, and just acknowledge that Kiwis have a right to free speech in New Zealand because we actually have a democracy where people are allowed to disagree and that's OK. It's a, it's a shocking concept. OK, so you people. are seeking a meeting with them? We, 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 we've um, had legal letters exchanged. We've also gone to uh, the district and city councils that fund them going, uh, you need to withdraw all funding from this venue until they start playing by the rules. And and the rules are clearly outlined in the New Zealand Bill of Rights Act that, that clearly allows for political opinions to be expressed. When did you get onto this, Jonathan? 
We were approached um, earlier last week and then uh, things really began to move uh, at the end of last week. So we're still waiting for the lawyers to get back to us, but we've been in touch with their board, uh, with their management, and uh, and it'll be interesting to see their response. You know, the, the, the problem with the, our would-be censors is that they often paint themselves into a corner where backing down is costly for them. We saw that. Yeah, well, Sport Northland... Yeah, Sport Northland wouldn't front for us on Friday. We are talking to the Mayor of Kuiper later in the program, Craig Jepson, mm. who I think mm. is on side... Well, he supports free speech from, from the comments I've seen, but uh, we haven't done the interview yet. Um, Jonathan, are you surprised? Are you, and I always get the feeling I sit there, how can people possibly think this is OK? Or if we created a culture where can and this is cancellation. Uh, I was just talking actually about um, uh, about Cam Wallace from MediaWorks joining this pile on on Wayne Brown. It does seem to me we've created a culture. I, I, I just can't imagine a world where I would discriminate against someone in a in a situation like this because of their politics or because I I disagreed with them. It'd you be know, like firing exactly someone right, for, sure. for voting for the wrong party. Uh, it's just crazy. But uh, th that's why the concerns around free speech, to me, uh, are, are so much bigger than what's coming out of Parliament or the laws that are at play. It's really a shift in our society in the way we think we can control what other people say. And, and actually what underlines that is maybe an implicit belief that we can somehow control what other people think. It does not end well when adults try to control each other in that way. Uh, I think more than one or two pub brawls have emerged from that sort of thing. And at a societal level, uh, I, I think it's the same again, that people will really resent this this um, patronising way of approaching it. Your question was, am I surprised? Look, you know, maybe it's a bit ridiculous for the chief executive of a free speech organisation. We're having to deal with cases that often don't end up in the media like this quite often. But I was surprised at this case. I was just surprised at how blatant they were that, no, we will not host you. The reason we won't host you is because of your political opinions and move on as if they, they, they just could wave them away with a flick of their hand. And so I, I think the court cases, both in the, uh, the Stefan Molyneux and, and the Lawrence Southern case that you mentioned with the, the uh, Supreme Court decision against the Auckland Council that we took, uh, the Speak Up for Women case against Palmerston North City Council, and, and, and several other cases that we've engaged in, uh, the precedent is very clear in recent court decisions that this won't stand for bodies that receive public funding. And so I think uh, we, the, what, what's really important important here is that the message gets out that, that, that the coverage is such that it is made clear that the law of this land as expressed through our courts still stands for controversial opinions to be allowed to be expressed. And that's why to indicate the further cultural demise around this, you guys are the only people talking about this issue. It's a real indication of the state. Oh, I was going to ask you, because you know what, that. a lot of media get public funding. But they seem to cancel as well through their editorial judgments and who they'll let on air. And I was going to ask, is anyone but the platform following this story? No, we, uh, you know, we, we have uh, interactions with media across the level and uh, whole different types of media. Uh, and and we, we sent out our press release to, you know, 700 media outlets or journalists. Uh, on Friday, and, and you guys are the only people who are interested in following this. Uh, yeah, maybe they're too busy it. bagging Wayne Brown, uh, to be honest, uh, <laughs> Jonathan. Jonathan, while I have you here, there's another story we're going to look at later this week. And that was uh, is what appears to be moves to un introduce some sort of instruction in disinformation recognition into the school syllabus. Which, given the large amount of, well, I think questionable philosophy and approach through those who run disinformation projects and the like, would seem to me to be a real concern. That is almost educating people into cancel culture, is it not? Or has, has the risk of being so? It absolutely has the risk of being so. I would want to see the material first. At one level, the uh, the principle or the concept is actually quite good. It says, let's 
stop bandying this term about misinformation, disinformation. They really mean nothing at this stage except something I disagree with. And that's the, the extent to which the term has been debased. But really, Sean, uh, it, it's important that we have a conversation about mis or disinformation because when a society gets wrapped up in false ideas, it is very dangerous. And so there's nothing necessarily anti-free speech about saying if it's fake or false, we need to be able to identify it. But the problem is when that gets politicized, and we know it will get politicized. Uh, and, and then we get into this point where actually is it more of a ministry of truth type uh, uh, outlet. And, and, and the disinformation project has certainly been operating with that sort of mandate. And so what are the safeguards that is actually going to be teaching critical thinking in our schools? Heck, I think that sounds like a great idea. Is it going to be teaching like uh, uh, literacy, uh, for, uh, digital literacy and, and uh, other ways to identify inconsistencies? Our children will benefit from that. But is it going to be talking about substance? This idea is disinformation because we deem it so and that's it. I, I, I think that's probably about the extent that we would see a lot of people uh, go at the moment in, in terms of developing skills to identify disinformation. And that's going to further politicize our schooling system. It's going to drive more division in our society. And actually, not to sound like a broken record, but free speech and open debate is the only way to address those issues. Yeah. And so before you were talking about, uh, you know, when, when uh, Speak Up for Women was dropped from the university campus, they were actually at a council venue. And it was, I just brought it to the university campus because we see so much um, antagonism against free speech coming from our educational system. And I first got really uh, invested in the fight for free speech in New Zealand when uh, Don Brash was cancelled from that massive university. I've sat down with Jan Thomas, the vice chancellor there, and, and how did it task over how on earth she thought that was going to be a productive decision forward. And of course, the Free Speech Union was very pleased to host on Brash last year at Massey to kind of give an, an opportunity to, to have his say there. But when our education system is becoming a tool against uh, free speech, which has actually been the basis of developing knowledge for centuries, I'm not sure what our next generation is going to really be able to, how they're going to be able to move forward and progress yeah. knowledge. Jonathan, just back uh, to the case up north uh, of Sport Northland. Um, how do you fund a case like this? This costs money. Who pays for it? That's a good question, Sean. Uh, the, the generous donors and members of the Free Speech Union do. We have um, about 85,000 supporters around the country. Uh, for an organisation our size, we've got, we, we had about 6,000 individual donors last year. Most people chipping in, you know, yeah. 70 or 80 bucks. And yeah. so uh, for a lot of people, I know it's hard times, but 70 or 80 bucks, even yeah. just on a case like this, makes Believe a real Believe me, difference. that's exactly what I'm after. A little bit more, actually, uh, Jonathan. And when do you <laughs> expect some progress? And this week, you'd expect to hear something back? Oh, I I suppose I they're running off, they'll be running off to their lawyers spending ratepayers money now, won't they? They, they, they had better get back to us in the next in the next uh, couple of days, otherwise we're just going to push on ahead. And I don't think, it's, uh, given the precedents that have come out recently, it's going to take kindly to this sort of action. So I don't think we've heard the end of the story yet. Good on you, Jonathan. Thank you very much for joining us. Jonathan Ayling from the Free Speech Union. Well, you heard it here first. In fact, you won't hear this story anywhere else. Because the great protectors of freedom of speech and public debate, I don't want to talk about it because it's not on their woke agenda, is it? Um, so the Free Speech Union is taking or has sent lawyers' letters to Sport Northland about their cancellation, their refusal to hire a public venue to the group Stop Co-Governance. We will stay right across the story here on the platform. And, in fact, uh, coming up next, we talk to one of the mayors of one of the public organisations that uh, funds uh, the uh, Sport Northland. Wow, have we got some stuff on my views on, well, I think the unholy, unholy flood of criticism of, of Wayne Brown, right in the middle of, of a crisis. I totally agree on comments about Wayne Brown. Simon Wilson seems to only play the man, not the ball, shouldn't be a journalist. No, I've always thought Simon Wilson should just run for office or, you know, become an official in the Labor Party or the Green Party. would be much m more honest of him. Sean, if MSM disagree with Sport Northland, they may have to give government journalism money back. You got it, Hugh. 
You got it. That's the issue. They're not saying it because they're paid not to run these stories because they sign up to the Treaty of Waitangi Framework, which believes in this. Um, Sean, Wayne Brown is a total idiot. You had a beer with him. More access than Auckland ratepayers had. Thank God when an earthquake strikes my city, Wellington, we won't have him as our mayor. Does he have a game of tennis today? Well, I don't know what Tori Farnow is doing today if Tori Farnow plays tennis, but she won't come on the platform. Though I have had the odd drink with her, not since she's become mayor. Okay, fairly robust discussions you have with old Tory too, I must say. Um, shouldn't, uh, woohoo, go Jonathan Ayling, fantastic. This will stop the nonsense. Well, you hope it will stop the nonsense. Anyone with half a brain at Sport Northland could have seen this coming. But I guess they were just hoping that the mainstream media would keep doing the government's bidding and not point out their rank hypocrisy.